Hi there, my name's Christian Henson and welcome to Nerding for the Weekend. This is arguably the first of these shows, so apologies if I seem a bit nervous. That's because I am. And we did a pilot last week which was well received. You don't have to check that out, but do let me know what you think of this format. Basically, it's my attempt at providing a little antidote for the lockdown blues specifically aimed at us shed-dwelling nerds. So this week, like all weeks, we'll be dropping a bunch of free pianos from the Piano Book community, and there's a fantastic toy piano in this week's lineup. We'll be dancing the macabre, doing a particularly nerdy review of a film that was released in 1975. If I had an ambition for nerding for the weekend, it would be a sheddier, nerdier version of the BBC's The One Show. And for those of you who don't live in the UK, that means I'm setting my sights incredibly low. So we're going to be joined by a guest on my telly box over there. But first, what are you guys up to? I've encouraged people to share with the community what they've been doing to fight the lockdown blues with this handle, Nerding for the Weekend. And this is what we found. This is an appeal to all you sample nerds out there. Hildeman wants us to make a clockwork library together. Hi everybody, um, my name is Jay. He was nervous about putting up his first YouTube, don't be, it was excellent, has finally cracked a way of using the pitch bend controller for expression. All of these and more to come linked below. And do keep them coming. Hashtag nerding for the weekend. No one else has that handle, it's just us. But talking of absolutely mental ideas, mental projects. I have a friend who started something and I sense that he may be biting off more than he can chew. This gentleman is an amazing composer, a really generous contributor to Piano Book, has become an amazing samplist, but also I think a YouTube star of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Mr. Dan Keane. Hello, hello. How are you doing, mate? You all right? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on this first episode oh, no, as well. I feel, a... I feel really honoured. Oh, thanks, yeah. mate. No, so it's a real, I've been really admiring you from, well, from the telly box and it's it yes. feels weird that <laughs> that this this image that I'm so used to is now talking back to me directly yeah well likewise I mean it really feels like I'm in one of your videos it really does yeah <laughs> you are <laughs> yes I am yeah that's right so listen for, for, for the benefit of people who have not uh, uh, seen your channel or seen this thing basically lockdown has restricted your ambitions somewhat so you decided somewhat. to do something and you thought the response was going to be muted, and it hasn't been. But let, take us back to the beginning. So about two weeks ago, I decided that uh, as I wasn't allowed to go outside and sample various players or instruments and things like that, that I would just ask everyone to submit one note with the hope that maybe they'd contribute a sound or a voice or something. And then, of course, you know, what I expected to be four or five entries then became about 200, and it's just been... An absolute kind of monumental storm. I mean, every day it's been it's been amazing, but such a great journey because, uh, I mean, like on my Logic screen now at the moment has 456 tracks of of audio, and I haven't even finished yet. I've still got two more sound worlds to um, to get through. But uh, yeah, the idea was just to create one of these thrumming textures libraries out of these various sounds, and then um, hopefully there'd be enough material there that I could turn into sounds. But um, can you explain the, the from, concept behind the thrumming textures? I don't I don't know where when it kind of when I first thought about it, but the idea really of just sort of any anything that would naturally have a decay to it, you sort of you just keep playing the same notes sort of over and over and this um if you do it sporadically enough and at you know a, a kind of unusual tempos and things like that, you um you end up sort of getting this just undulating thing that goes under dialogue, I think, quite well. And and I think you've spoken a lot about um the sort of idea of music that doesn't necessarily go anywhere but isn't also too kind of static. And I think that's that's sort of um that's something I've been interested in recently and in just kind of creating those those tones that kind of bubble away. John Cage said that, that music is just noise that's been organised. I, I believe that sound, noises, before they're organised, can uh, create an emotional reaction. And I think that that idea of creating kind of micro performances, so the, the, the performance is there, the sound is there, but it's not yet been organised into music, I think is a great way of 
of creating a, a slightly more emotional effect that you would be would do from your standard slightly less characterful virtual instruments especially when you're having to l use them in this very kind of minimal way Absolutely. I do agree with that. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, for a lot of this kind of battle with creating this instrument has been about thinking, well, we want to create a library that's going to maintain all that nuance, like you say, of these micro performances. Obviously, everything was performed by different people on different instruments um, and in, in completely different recording situations and environments. So some people would send in things from microphones or some people would send stuff in from phones. So I think maintaining that integrity to what they originally recorded is obviously important. But at the same time, I think... Um, there can be chaos to all these random notes sort of springing off at one time. And there is something about bringing that kind of cohesion together um, with a sound that works and is sort of homogenous across the whole keyboard, but still has its own kind of little zones and things. But I think um, the thing with it, with a sampling kind of adventure is that, um, yeah, these little performances can, can and do make for really great sampling material. Um, and yeah, I, I, that's what I love about about things like your swarm libraries and stuff like that with Spitfire is like, it's that kind of idea of just things that just kind of keep going and, and it could be a piece, you know, but it's, it's kind of recorded as, um, yeah, just sort of usable keyboard instruments. I guess I've not thought of it this way, but it has an inherent life to it. Absolutely. Without you having yeah, to kind definitely. of motor it into moving around and becoming melodic or anything like that, which again is, is not, it's not us kind of copping out of composing. It is really what directors want from us mainly because there's too much music uh, these days. Absolutely. So therefore yeah. you can't be going the full John Williams all the time, can you? No. No, and I think the I think the landscape has changed a lot as well in the way that um the kind of the sonic spectrum is being used up as well. It's um I don't know. I don't think I don't think there's as much place now for us to have these huge scores in places. Sometimes the underscoring is all you need and and to have simpler but kind of focused and intimate layers can can really bring that kind of emotive sense to the score like you say. Um, so how are you approaching this gargantuan task? How have you how have you curated it, broken it down, and why do you have so many more tracks? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I first of all decided that the only way I'd ever be able to actually turn this into an instrument would be to sort of separate it into sort of hits, sustains, and then the miscellaneous rusty gate sounds. Um, and so <laughs> having kind of organised things into these three categories, I guess it was sort of like a priority level. Like I knew that the hits and the sustains were going to be more usable, more immediately usable than the miscellaneous, although I have managed to use every single sample that someone sent in. Um, and then it's just been a case of, I wanted to do these like sound worlds. So I'd have sort of a soft kind of undulating, the kind of thrumming textures sound. Uh, that was like soft burbles, I called it. And then there was like a, a short pulses uh, library, which is more kind of the clangs of the bowls and various other things that people have sent in. And then there was this kind of weightless atmospheres track, which was a sort of synthesizer based kind of pad library, I suppose. And then the final one was this one called Rough Edges, which is kind of the gritty, get the sandpaper out, kind of make it sound a bit a bit nasty. The first goal is it has to sound good, you know. Uh, like, it, it can't be one of those romantic novelties that just sort of, oh, it was really nice that you did this thing, but it was a bit crap, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, that's, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's what so, I was uh, dreading with music by 300 Strangers. When I pressed play the first time, it was like, what have absolutely. I done? But it's like, no, we have to make this into something that's that's pleasant to listen to it's a subtractive process isn't it you have to be quite ruthless about it and say this line works here but absolutely doesn't work there or i mean some people have sent me whole files that take up the whole sonic spectrum and it's like well we don't really have space for that but we can maybe get you down to this or whatever you know and just kind of yeah finding a place for everything to go in i was really inspired by the music by 300 strangers that's sort of in a way that's sort of what kind of inspired it because this community effort of so many people coming together um, I mean, yeah, it was really, really something to to be part of, and also for people who might have, and in these these people's cases, might have the chance to record one instrument or or something like that, um, but didn't necessarily have the kind of resources or or players available to them to turn it into a massive piece like you've done, or or a huge sample library in the in this case. But um, yeah, that was sort of the the main motive behind it. Yeah. Now, it's very interesting you should bring that up because um, linked below is a fantastic new list that's been created by PRS for Music and the fantastic composer Nainita Desai, who I'm very honoured to refer to as a friend. And this is basically a list of 
musicians who are able to record from home. And I really would urge you to continue using live musicians on your productions. This part of the music industry has been torn to bits by the lockdown. So I would really humbly recommend for you to give it a try and to possibly, into even when lockdown has finished, use this as a real... I just never think there's an, uh, an excuse not to use a live musicians. And these people will be the people who are playing on Hans's scores, who are playing on Desplaz scores, uh, Patrick Doyle's scores. These will be the cream of the crop. They're available to us all to make use of, to use their talents on. So do check out that list down below. So, Dan, do you have anything interesting you can show us yet? Or is it like showing showing off a haircut before the ro rollers are out? <laughs> no, I, I can show you a little bit. So this is um, this is sort of a, a crossfade between uh, the soft burbles layer and starting to go into the uh, the short pulses layer. So you can sort of hear that, that within each of these zones, um, I've sort of I've curated sort of octave octave span um, samples that overlap. Uh, so at any one time, there'll be two sets of zones playing at any one time. And then obviously part of what builds that up uh, is about five or six different people at a time. So it spans all the way from C minus one all the way up to C7. So all these little kind of these little areas, if you move up the keyboard, um, you suddenly move into a new world, which is quite nice and quite quite inspiring, I, I have to say. Amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's, sounding, it's been really good fun. Absolutely stunning. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to keeping a kind of uh, an eye on your progress. Do check out Dan's YouTube channel below. I know I always say this, go blue, blue in the face, but if you do enjoy people's YouTube channels and you do return to them and, and use the wonderful inspiration and advice they give, please, please subscribe because there are certain benefits that uh, YouTube artists don't get before they're above a certain subscription level that can really help the YouTube channel out. So uh, subscriptions, likes and views are very much the fuel of any YouTube creator, aren't they, Dan? Absolutely. And and it's interesting, actually, you mentioned before about the, the PRS link, because I have to thank you. Because of this platform, I am actually kind of being paid to do remote recording for people at the moment because of things that they've seen or instruments that they've liked from the Piano Book site and things like that. So it's been... Um, so, yeah, I, I do highly recommend the, the remote recording thing. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I've not, I've not, I didn't know that, Dan, and that's just the greatest news because, it, to be honest, that is at the heart of what I really would love Piano Book to become a source of revenue uh, for people and it's absolutely stunning so when do you think you're going to have this done and where are going to, people going to be able to download it when it's done it will all be available on the piano book site once it's all once it's all finished i've definitely broken the back of it now it took a, a couple of days of real kind of brainstorming and just sitting in front of a whiteboard thinking how on earth am i going to get all these people into this instrument i'd like to get it finished in the next few days it'd be nice if it could go up next week really one thing that's been great about the youtube thing and about piano book in general is that you know, I'd, I'd have made these instruments for myself anyway, but the fact that you're able to put something up and get immediate feedback from people, or or even if that feedback's all really nice because everyone's really nice on the community, it's just it's it's a nice kind of affirmation of knowing that you're heading in the right direction or that you're working on something that that is worth something and you know could be could be a value at some point later down the line or whatever. So, yeah, I think. Um, it's, it's been really nice getting that kind of immediate response from the community, yeah. I think there's a special magic from getting you to do remote recordings and using your sample sets, and that is because you live in the same town as someone really famous, don't you? Yeah, it's weird. I mean, whenever I say to someone, I live in this tiny village that you might never have heard of, um, no one would have any interest. But when you say you come from the village that Winnie the Pooh's from, it's uh, it's quite it's quite cute, really, seeing all these tourists walking past in a village that probably has two or 3,000 people, if that, um, to go and play poo sticks and, you know, 100 Acre Wood and all that stuff. It's all, it's all back there somewhere. Well, I'll be pressuring you for a, a Winnie the Pooh-inspired library once your thrumming textures era comes to <laughs> yes. a close dan thanks so much it's dan keen on youtube and as i say do check out his youtube channel subscribe and his socials down below dan do you mind sticking around for the rest yeah, of the sure. show yeah, uh, i'll just to. Uh, be interested to get your your feedback on certain things as well so this week i've been listening to 
Dance Macabre by Sanson, uh, more commonly famous for his carnival of hits, really, his Carnival des Animals, or Carnival of the Animals. And it's interesting because there are some uh, melodic similarities between the two pieces, particularly with his piece about the dancing skeletons. I guess there is a, a correlation there. I'm researching this for a major new project that I'm working on with the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And as a reminder, I don't really read music and kind of follow a score. I'm not a great sight reader. And it's times like this that I do get frustrated that I didn't go to music college because there's all sorts of kind of theoretical context I'm sure I'm missing. It's for a kind of smallish orchestra and solo violin. <laughs> I was really like really excited to actually get the music for the double stopped bit but actually on a piano it really sounds quite kind of dull. It doesn't have the excitement, the kind of terror of the the violin. I guess if you put the keep the sustain pedal down it's slightly more effective. And I guess if I was to do an homage to Dance Macabre on the piano, I would make the most of that, whatever that tone is, a devil's tritone or something. It has such a dissonance to it. It creates all sorts of harmonic distortion when the uh, uh, sustain pedal is uh, depressed. So if I was to do a, a rethinking of Dance Macabre for piano or uh, an homage to it, I would very much rely on the sustain of all three notes. slightly minory reminders of Thomas Newman's amazing theme tune to Six Feet Under. And Dan, you're a, I can see... I started on violin when I was about five and then uh, started the viola when I was about seven or eight, I think. And um, then the viola became the instrument that I would play in orchestras and things like that. So the Dance Macabre is one that I've actually played in orchestra quite a few times. Um, and so that was nice to revisit because it's been a while since I've played in orchestras now that I'm a composer. <laughs> the, the feature that I'm fascinated with, and again, as I just demonstrated, you know, it doesn't sound so great when you play the the uh, the violin line on the piano. It's something that really makes um, the the well the kind of macabre tone that really sets it off is the violin, and it's double stopping, isn't it? And that creates I think a combination of the intervals being played and the action of double stopping creates. I don't know, that slight tension, that slight demonic tone. Why do you think that is? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think um, with this with this piece, I'm, I'm pretty sure the E string is tuned down to an E flat. So oh. that tritone, that, that musical devil is, um, is, is open strings, which makes a huge difference as well. Um, I mean, the higher you go up the fingerboard, the more kind of uh, potentially the warmer, the more kind of mellow it gets. Right. Um, so certainly for open strings, I mean, that's really that's really the most kind of brittle that it could be. Um, and like you say, quite kind of devilish somehow. Um, Absolutely. Like they're dancing, yeah. But for me, the highlight of the piece is when he takes the questioning theme. And the answering theme. And jams them together. There's something so exhilarating about it. Stick around and I'll let you know what piece we'll be listening to next week. Right, now on to something of a more fishy nature. You yell barracuda. Everybody says, huh? What? You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. So Dan, have you managed to have a look at Jaws recently? I have. I had some shark-infested dreams last night. Oh, you watched uh, it last night? I watched it. I watched it last night. Yeah. Have you seen it, it before? Been a while. Yeah, I had seen it before. Yeah, and it had been. It'd been quite a long time actually. It's definitely a scary film, but there are so many more angles to it than than I kind of remembered there being. Obviously, I remembered the shark, but the kind of the viewpoint of of Martin and his kind of journey with trying to get this small island to play ball and and to kind of close down the beaches and things. I think was actually something that I'd kind of forgotten about. It's quite, it's quite, uh, 
there's quite a lot of depth to the um, to the narrative, isn't there? Yeah. And I, I, I just I picked it because I just thought it was an, an an accessible movie that I have seen recently and thought was amazing, and it's really stood the test of time. But it's uh, remarkably poignant with this kind of yeah. slightly overweight, eccentric narcissist running the town, refusing <laughs> to accept that there's a danger, a very clear yes. and present danger. Yes. Yeah. I think I know what you're saying. With that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I, I mean, it's uh, it, it's an instant classic, isn't it? I mean, it's it's one of those films that I think changed changed things for forever in the film industry. What, what was it? 1975. Yes. It, uh, released. Yeah. And obviously, when you've got a a Steven Spielberg and John Williams collab like this. I think this was the second, was it the second film they worked possibly, on together? Possibly, yes. I, they may um, have done Sugarland Express together, possibly. They had, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's a short interview on, on YouTube um, sort of talking between Steven Spielberg and John Williams about the score. And um, it's, it's really interesting how how invested, even from way back then, I mean, they've done, what, 23, 24 films together now. Um, even back then, just knowing the kind of um, the gravitas that John Williams was going to bring to uh, Spielberg's films, it was like, well, we've got to have him on everything we can. Absolutely. You know? yeah. Well, also, you know, I think that that Steven Spielberg to this day has nightmares about the the Jaws shoot, and the, right. the main nightmare was a combination of open water and a shark that didn't work. And I don't know if this is, uh, you know, apocryphal um, or, or, or euphoric recall from John Williams, but uh, apparently uh, uh, Steven Spielberg just went, the shark didn't work, you're the shark. And yeah, I think it's a absolutely. testament to, to the power of music, the power of John Williams' music, but also I think the um, Steven Spielberg's power of forming a narrative, and I think a lot of that narrative was formed in the edit, which is why I personally think it's three films or three, yeah. three tropes. It starts, for me, very much as a horror film. It feels like a horror film. Then it goes into this quite fascinating character study, you know, of, 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 of three very alphas within their field together on a boat um, culminating in that amazing monologue to it becoming quite a schlocky pulpy action yeah. movie with a shit shark <laughs> yeah i have to say though i mean from the very beginning we see a shot under the water we hear the theme we already know who the villain is you know and like within the first 10 seconds we've we've already know what what the uh I guess what what's happening, um, and so to be able to kind of pace that out across a film that still has narrative depth and still has that kind of you know those emotional cues as well, because the music isn't just horror, is it? Like no, there's, there's no. a lot in there that um, it's very interesting because it, for me it conveys horror and joy. He's an arch manipulator, Steven Spielberg, um, uh, and I think he used music to kind of embody the shark, and therefore really. It's very in interesting because he couldn't play the tension with the music. He had to play it with hyping up the sound design, certainly with the, f the, the fisherman, that whole sequence, very much yeah. hyping up the, the lapping of the water, um, uh, the, the use of day for night. Um, and he can't use score because the score embodies the presence of the shark. Absolutely. And I think yeah. when finally he's free to use the score to manipulate in a way that doesn't embody the shark, it's sheer joy and adventure, which I think is fantastic. But what he doesn't do, with exception, I think, to the last cue, is he doesn't use the music to create a, a feeling of sentimentality or a feeling of loss. He makes, mm. and as a consequence, it's just really fucking bleak. When that woman comes and slaps Brody around the face, you know, that's the point at which my little boy went, I'm done with this film, Dad, because he could really feel it was just very real, almost documentary like. So, yeah, yeah. The, the kind of sentimental thing I think entered into Spielberg and John Williams' work, you know, around the, the time of, I mean, cl even Close Encounters is, is a much bleaker film. I think, you know, once you get, get into the Indiana Jones and the, and the ETs, that kind of sentimental feeling is there, but it's, it's not present in this film, which I think is very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And like you say about adventure as well. Well, I think there's there's that moment when is it the first girl who dies and the music behind it is um, is it's almost kind of mysterious and kind of intriguing almost it's kind of um, I don't know it reminded me a lot actually of the Harry Potter score actually in that kind of way of that kind of slightly magical slightly kind of unknown um, kind of uh, theme and it was strange because on the face of it some girl's about to get killed you know it's quite it's quite gruesome and it could be made even more gruesome there but there is that kind of sense of kind of mystery and intrigue behind it, even at that point, which I think sets the tone well for what the film is, which is these guys who 
you know, are all, like you say, alphas in their own fields, but suddenly are in a position to deal with something that none of them have ever had to deal with before. And it's that kind of, that sense of unknown, I think, that that is really brought out well. But, um, I mean, like you say, with the, with the theme that uh, sort of announces that the shark is arriving, I think there's that really interesting bit where those two kids are playing with the fake fin and are pretending that they're a shark. And you don't hear the music there because, of course the uh you know the the music wasn't there because yes. the shark wasn't there and i think that's what i think that hopefully that's possibly john's doing i i hate it as a as a i do a, a kind of a comedy horror series called inside number nine and we always play the truth and we think it's very unfair to hoax people with music particularly right. if you're using music to embody something. John Williams actually quite kind of openly admitted that he was trying to condition the audience into thinking, when I hear that music, um, they'll know that the shark is here, and then knew that because there was no music, there wouldn't be a shark. I mean, that's for people like us who actually listen to the music, and, and maybe more so than anything else. Um, yeah. But also, I mean, there's that bit later on when they're on the boat, and suddenly the shark comes up, but the the music hasn't warned us that it's coming. And that that is the biggest shock for me in the whole film, when it's like, oh, wow, there he is, you know. And um, I, I don't know if it's because of this conditioning of these two notes that kind of oscillate between each other, but um, a very usable theme as well. You know, you can do so much with that. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst we're talking about films, Will Henshaw has used his last weekend to come up with a new trailer for 1917. A lot of people ask me, you know, should I try and find some royalty clear footage to score, to show to potential clients? Um, I have two answers for that. I think that basically writing to picture has become a given and people don't necessarily ask for proof that you're capable of doing that. However, that's coming from someone who has kind of the visual proof on a CV that I've worked to picture a lot. If you are wanting to demonstrate your working to picture skills, I really wouldn't worry about what material you take, uh, provided you don't put it on your website, don't put it on YouTube. You're not going to be in serious trouble if you take a bit of, I don't know, Harry Potter and rescore it. Obviously, one of the problems with taking modern scores is they usually tend to have scores on them, which is why, as I alluded to when I underscored that scene that should definitely not be underscored but there are loads of films from that era where you'd imagine in a modern day setting they would be scored the one that pops into my head all the time and something i've always wanted to go at is if you ever want to try scoring amazing action sequences but with the sound effects intact as a means of trying to carve your music around it try the original version of rollerball starring james khan all of the battle sequences are completely scoreless so a really good opportunity to practice there right the moment we've all been waiting for this week's contributions from those amazing people within the piano book community first up husband's modular these unlabeled faders of mystery. Very nice. I imagine with a little bit of cheeky monkery, this is going to sound very bassy. Alqua, I'm sure there's a fascinating story behind this. Rain catcher. Looks like someone after my own heart. I love to sample a bowl. Now, there's a lovely story behind this, and I'm such a huge fan of this instrument. I will be featuring it in this month's highlights. So do subscribe and ding the bell for notifications for next time we put the video up. Every month, I do a roundup of the highlights of the piano book adventure that we're all on. But this is just sublime, well worth downloading for your weekend. Just loving it. it the release triggers are, are just where it's at, aren't they? And there's a sense of the room that it's recorded in, which I really like. I'll be returning to this one. Woodland Gate. Oh, it takes me back to a traumatic part of my life where I decided it would be interesting to try and encourage people to make nice sounds out of rusty gates, and I had to listen to 300 of them.
What I'm going to do is I'm going to slow this right down. Which is interesting. And then let's take it back up again. We have such an amazingly generous community in Piano Book. So do check out those pages directly down below, but also pianobook.co.uk. If you're not part of this community, you're really losing out. There's so much fun to be had. And as I mentioned before, Dan, you're, you're very active within Piano Book. And uh, we're yes. now dropping these pianos and instruments on a weekly basis. Are there any instruments other than your own that have brought you joy that you like using? Absolutely. Well, obviously, there are the kind of usual favourites that we see coming up every month. I mean, I love John Meyer's uh, contributions to the community and particularly his violin and flute library. I think that, that that swarm effect is something that has definitely inspired the thrumming textures idea for me. Um, there's also a library called the Bass Harmonic Chimes. I don't know if you've, I think you've used that one maybe once before in the, uh, I think it was a, a highlight one month. The thing I enjoy about sampling is, yes, I enjoy virtual instruments. I, I can now imitate what this instrument may sound like, or if I can't afford one, I'll just about get away with that trumpet sound. But for me, it's also about what's not possible in nature, isn't it? In particular with that bass harmonic chimes library, it's, um, and, and things like that, it, it demonstrates that you can make the impossible possible with, um, and, and like you said before, about kind of involving musicians earlier in the process and that's that's sort of all it all it is really it can create a new palette of sounds that just wouldn't have been possible otherwise yeah and for you uh, piano book other than being able to download free instruments um what what have you taken from it as a as a project i'd always been interested in creating my own kind of sample instruments anyway but i'd always been using um sort of commercial libraries from the beginning and now it's i'm now in a really interesting position with piano book where the libraries i'm downloading work at such lovely accompaniments to the kind of pre-existing, you know, the big commercial libraries that I use all the time anyway. And I think being able to provide, I was saying this to a director I'm working with the other day, that being able to create a kind of unique palette of sounds for, for every film, I think has, has enabled me to kind of gain a degree of, of musical, uh, musical um, uniqueness, I guess. And I think this is something that you've spoken about before as well. But this, this idea that you could... Um, that you could be kind of totally unique because that sound has never existed before and there's something really valuable to creating a palette of sounds from that. So for me, the Piano Book site and all the entries that I'm seeing, it's just inspiring to say, well, actually, yeah, I've never thought about making a musical library from some pots and pans around the house or whatever, you know, things like that, that really... Um, yeah, they just they just spark that kind of creativity, I think, and um, inspire. You know, beyond Piano Book, beyond YouTube, as a composer, what kind of bearing have you set for yourself on your journey? I'll be graduating in, well, I'll be finishing in about six weeks. Uh, so, you know, then, then I will be a quote-unquote professional who will have a job somewhere, hopefully. Um, but, my, I mean, the main, the main kind of uh, ambition at the moment is, is to learn skills that could be as useful as possible to potential composers for assisting work. I think you've proved that um, being a composer's assistant is a really great way to kind of develop those chops and, and to see what it's like on the level that you're trying to go into and um, and not kind of wanting to to jump the gun and, and knowing that there is that sense of progression that, that needs to be done. So if creating instruments or creating interesting sounds uh, is something that could be of use to composers, I think um, that's that would definitely kind of bode well for me. Um, and kind of just upping my production game, I suppose, yeah. Well, listen, Dan, thank you so much for joining us this week. And as I said before, Dan's YouTube channel is linked below. So please do go check it out and subscribe. And I'm really looking forward to Have you got a name for the project yet? I don't, actually. No, it's just been DK Isolation Collaboration. But may, I, might, I might have to come up with a... Something snappy. Yeah. <laughs> listen, best of luck with everything. And uh, thanks again, yeah, Dan. Thanks so and much. I'll thanks see you so very much soon. for having me on here as well. It's been Cheers. great. Yeah. Brilliant. So next week, we have another fantastic guest that will be joined by in, well, on the telly box within the studio. 
I'll also be watching the film by Alan J. Pakula, The Parallax View. If you've not seen this, do try and grab it. I believe it's available on iTunes and on YouTube. It's a real treat, something that may be off your radar. So I'm really looking forward to uh, dissecting that in a, in a nerdy manner and also introducing you to that if you've not seen it before. I'll be listening to Fratras or Fratras by Arvo Pett. Not only am I a huge fan, as are many people of this piece, I think he is too, because he's done dozens of versions of it. Enjoy them all, and we'll catch up next week about the wonderful thing that is that very, very special piece of music. Beyond the parallax view, the film I really wanted to share with us was Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation. However, and this is for me is one of the real frustrations of when formats become obsolete, is that they don't transfer everything from that format onto the new, well, streaming services. So if any of you know where we can watch The Conversation, certainly in the UK it's proving difficult, Europe, USA, then I'll happily suggest that as something we can watch together. But before I go, we have a contributor, Heather Hayes. Hello, Heather Hayes here with some very helpful advice. To see her video or any of the others, check out Dan's project or indeed download some of these free instruments. Check out the links down below and please subscribe. It would be lovely to see you not only next week, but there's a couple of vlogs coming out between now and then. So hit the notification bell if you want to be notified the next time I put a video up. And one of those to all of the fantastic contributions for all of these incredibly generous people. Do remain safe, stay indoors and stay apart if you can. I think at the moment is definitely the right thing to do. And for me anyway, I can already feel a sense of growing dread that this, I mean, it's not great, is it? But it is a very special time and I fear it will for the time being come to an end soon. So try and fill your time with stuff that you find difficult to do when life is back to its usual busy, hectic self. I've still got a basement that needs sorting out. Lots of love to you all, stay safe, and see you next time. 